Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'll start with our protocol, of course, of acknowledging the traditional owners of this land. I acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people, acknowledge them and the Noongar peoples of the South West generally, and pay respects to their elders and ancestors. Uh, thank you, Matthew Maguire, for your really wonderful welcome to country. I love hearing language and music and it's just wonderful. And I know that the Maguire family is such a respected family here in Perth, so thank you for that. And to Dr Jerk and Bomber for your response uh, and your uh, involvement in this, this speech for such a long time. Um, I have to acknowledge Dean Curtis, who has done a wonderful job in organising this lecture um, and keeping everything on track. Very, very well done, Dean. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge the assistance of um, Melanie Schwartz, who is an um, expert in this area uh, and has worked with us at Amnesty, and um, she provided some guidance to me on, uh, with this speech. And also we've got a, an intern that has assisted me, Ashling Murray. Um, and of course, all the wonderful people who have come here. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to recognise in particular my father, Dita, and, and, um, and my niece, Carly, up the back there. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, all, all the people that I've worked with and all, all the dignitaries. It's so wonderful to have all of you here. Um, I'm, I've taken a bit of an unusual track for, um, for a lawyer. I, I've turned into a campaigner. Uh, and I campaign on lots of things like, like NAIDOC and um, and justice reinvestment. And one of the things I have been campaigning on at Amnesty is a little campaign that we've got hashtag save the RDA. Uh, so I've got to share with you, I got very distracted today because, um, you know, we worked with so many other groups on that campaign to stop the amendments to the Racial Discrimination Act. And today, just recently, we've got the news that that, that won't go ahead. So sometimes we get these great wins in, in the campaigning we do. And um, it was really nice to have that today. So I've been a little bit distracted um, working on the, the Racial Discrimination Act, um, but now I'll talk about justice reinvestment, which is another thing I've been campaigning for for some time. So thank you for providing me with this opportunity to talk about justice reinvestment and, and what difference it could make here in Western Australia. I have been involved in this subject for some time in my work at the Aboriginal Legal Service, at the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples and at Amnesty International, where we're embarking on a campaign to reduce the detention of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth. Uh, we're focusing on a number of jurisdictions, uh, being Western Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland and then a national overview. But we're, we're in WA at the moment and um, our principal researcher, Julian's just flown in We've just from London. Um, we're doing some of our meetings tomorrow, so um, it all kind of coincides quite nicely. Um, although this approach to the criminal justice system is something that I've worked on in all these organisations and there's a crossover in, in everything I've been involved in, today I'm, I'm speaking in a private capacity. I'm bringing all of that stuff from the different organisations I've worked on together um, and I'm not actually speaking on behalf of any one organisation. Uh, so that's a bit of the introduction. So justice reinvestment and the ideas surrounding prevention and diversion are seen as possible solutions to the growing incarceration rates in Australia. This, uh, this is a problem, of course, for our whole society, but it's particularly a problem for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And because of that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the justice system, particularly here in Western Australia, before I go into the mechanics of what justice reinvestment is. So I think everyone would be aware of the vast over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the justice systems and that Western Australia is often touted as one of the worst jurisdictions in this regard, especially when the comparative statistics are viewed by rate of imprisonment as shown in this table from 2012 which shows um, adult imprisonment by indigeneity. Once, once you start to look at the, pro the proportions, because Aboriginal people make up, a, I think it's about 4% of the population here in Western Australia, then WA starts to skyrocket. Northern Territory actually incarcerates um, more, <laughs> but they have more Aboriginal people. So when we look at it from this perspective, you can just see how much of an issue it is here in Western Australia. Currently, in Western Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and when I say currently, at um, Austra Western Australia, we actually publish our statistics on the incarceration of people broken down into gender 
and um, Aboriginality. Uh, weekly, there's weekly offender statistics. If you Google that, it'll come up. So this week's stats show that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults generally, I think it was 39.5, but I'm gonna say 40% of the prison population. The youth this week was 77%, but I've seen that go up to as high as 85 um, of juveniles incarcerated. 67% um, of juvenile justice orders are for Aboriginal kids. And then also I like to include the protective, um, the, the child protection system as well, because it's, it's, it's a kind of a flow on from child protection to juvenile detention to adults in prison. And currently in Western Australia, our children make up 49.5% of all those kids in protective custody. So sadly, this is not just in Western Australia, um, this is across Australia. And it's not just incarceration. Our Aboriginal people are disproportionately affected by all areas of the justice system, whether it be child protection, juvenile justice or adult justice. We're more likely to be removed from our parents as children. We're more likely to have children removed from us um, or monitored or investigated, whether that be through the child protection or even the family court systems. We're more likely to be the victims of crime. We're more likely to have contact with police. We're more likely to be charged with offences. We're more likely to be convicted of offences. We're more likely to receive harsher sentences uh, for offences, including higher fines. And then on the flip side, we're less likely to receive police cautions. We're less likely to receive sentences that are alternatives to incarceration or detention. We're less likely to be granted parole once incarcerated. And we're less likely to receive access to rehabilitative and through care programs. The cycle then continues with our people more likely to repeat offend. So when you consider the system like this, uh, even though we call it a justice system, when it comes to being Aboriginal, it's hardly a just system. The reasons for this involve a complex interplay of uh, historical and contemporary reasons, uh, factors and social determinants. I don't have time today to go into all those historical factors, but I do note that the situation of dispossession, discrimination, oppression and institutionalisation that have been suffered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is similar to that which has been suffered by Indigenous peoples in many other nations around the world. And, and together, I, I refer to it as the Indigenous Peoples Movement, together internationally we are coming together to talk about these things. In fact, the expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous people in the last two years have had a, a priority focus on access to justice for Indigenous peoples because it's such a big issue all around the world. If you're interested in learning more about the situation here in Australia though, um, there's some really great, I mean there's so much that has been written, but I would recommend you being, have a look at the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which was released in 1991, the Bringing Them Home report on the National Inquiry into the Separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children from Their Families, released in 1995, and um, this, the Country Report from the Special Rapporteur when he first came to Australia in 2010 is, is a great summary of the situation for Indigenous peoples historically and contemporary. The historical disadvantage suffered by our people is, is, is perpetuated by the disproportionate impact that a tough on crime, a tough law and order regime has on disadvantaged minority groups, including Indigenous peoples, by targeting, over policing and discrimination against our people by the very individuals that uphold the laws, including policy makers, police and the judiciary. This includes laws like mandatory sentencing, which take away the ability for the judiciary to consider circumstances. And we know that in Western Australia, we're one of the jurisdictions that does impose mandatory sentencing. As sad as the overrepresentation and underlying causal factors are, what's worse is that the numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have, have contact with the justice system has been increasing in recent years and they're projected to increase even more over the next 20 years due specifically to our large youth population moving into adulthood, as dem demonstrated by this graph. So you can see the red uh, is the Aboriginal and the grey is the non-Aboriginal. The grey, this bit sort of represents the baby boomers, um, whereas we have a huge youth population and they're coming into adulthood. So we, we need to prepare for that as policy makers and 
uh, if, if the laws and the system stays the way it is with this, with these, this youth coming through, the stats will rise. We'll, we'll just keep locking up more and more people. So, unfortunately in Australia there really has been a lack of political leadership to address these grave concerns and the projected increases in over-representation and there's been little to hold the government to account. The incarceration and victimisation of our people has been normalised and there's become this sense of government and community apathy about the situation. I mean, Aboriginal people have been locked up since non-Aboriginal people came here, so there is this apathy. You know, people are used to it happening, that the, the outrage is not there. And instead of in trying to reduce the incarceration, political leaders have historically pushed this tough on crime law and order campaigns, pumping out more and more laws with harsher penalties, incarcerating more and more people. A classic example is the Criminal Law Amendment Home Burglary and Other Offences Bill of 2014, which is currently before the WA Parliament. This bill was created to get tough on home invasions. Uh, and it proposes to extend mandatory sentencing for bur burglary to juveniles by suspending the section of the Young Offenders Act, which in tandem with international law, gives judges discretion when it comes to sentencing children. As a result, if this bill pass passes, Children involved in home invasions in WA will be detained, regardless of the circumstances that brought them there. Although this tough on crime rhetoric may assist with the popular vote during elections and make the broader community feel safer, whether in reality it makes them safer, the fact of the matter is that a tough on crime approach to justice simply is not sustainable. For our peoples, it's not socially sustainable. And for everyone else, it's not financially sustainable with enormous costs associated with incarceration. Over $12.5 billion is spent on the criminal justice system in Australia every year. And as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prisoners make roughly a quarter of the adult prisoner population nationally, that means about $3 billion is spent on imprisoning our men and women each year. And if we add to the costs all the other aspects of the criminal justice system, including the juvenile detention uh, juvenile detention, the costs associated with police, the judiciary and legal aid, we start to get a glimpse of the enormous picture uh, of the, the, sorry, the true picture of the enormous financial burden that our justice system imposes on society. And for Aboriginal people, this is heightened by recidivism, which is a word for repeat offending, um, which are much higher for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander inmates than for non-Aboriginal population. Um, the 2010 report from the WA Parliament Making Prisons Work noted that the Aboriginal recidivism rates were 70% for adult males, 55% for female adults, 80% for Aboriginal juveniles and 34% for Aboriginal female juveniles, which was markedly higher than for non-Aboriginal people. So the system really is failing Aboriginal people, not just Aboriginal people, it's failing in many regards. And with this in mind, the time for change is imminent. And around the world, particularly in Western countries that have inherited the British system of justice, policymakers are looking for alternatives. And in Australia, calls for reform to the justice system, especially from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are growing stronger each day. And we're starting to see change, including a plethora of diversionary programs being developed, which are gaining funding and community support. Uh, the reforms are about uh, pushing for a shift in thinking, a change in the rhetoric from tough on crime to smart on crime approaches to justice, which is also referred to as solution-based policy, using prevention, early intervention, diversion and rehabilitation. In particular, in regards to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, there is a push for programs that involve the participants to learn their cultures. There are a number of programs in Australia that have had uh, positive effects with positive results in diverting people from the justice system and slowing recidivism rates by offering these sorts of rehabilitative programs which are founded on the concept of culture as a preventative mechanism. Um, you might have heard of the HALO leadership program here in Perth and there's the Euroman project up in the Kimberley and there's another one down, um, Eugene Eads runs down in Esperance um, and these are all really focused on um, diverting and rehabilitating Aboriginal children particularly from the justice system. But now, 
I wanted to move to this more full discussion of justice reinvestment. Um, so justice reinvestment was this concept that emerged in the United States just over a decade ago and it was driven by four main factors. First, spendings on corrections in the US had risen faster in the 20 years from 1998 to 2008 than spending on nearly any other ba uh, state budget item, increasing from about $12 billion to $52 billion a year. In fact, that was the main reason that they came up with this concept in the US. They had this, this think tank, but it was about money. It was costing so much money to the American taxpayer. Second, despite mounting correction spending, the rates of recidivism remained high and by sub-measures it had actually worsened. Third, research was pointing to practices and programs that can effectively reduce crime and rates of recidivism. And finally, it was becoming clear that policymakers often did not have the information or factors that are driving crime, re-offence rates and the growth of correctional populations resulting in poor policy making. And I think that happens quite a lot, you know, when, when politicians are, are making bills and they go through Parliament and they've, they've, they've done on popular demand or to, to, to hear what the electorate wants to hear rather than on firm policy, on, on, on evidence-based research. The pioneering influence for justice reinvestment came from the George Soros Open Society Institute in a 2003 report entitled uh, Ideas for an Open Society Justice Reinvestment. Its overarching aim was to reduce the high levels of and the subsequent financial burden of incarceration. However, this was not simply a task of rethinking and redirecting public funds. Funds. It was driven by a need to devolve accountability and responsibility to the local level, thus seeking community level solutions to community level problems. The idea gained traction and it was coordinated by the Justice Centre, an organisation within the Council of State Governments, a national not-for-profit organisation that serves policy makers at the local, state and federal levels from all branches of government. It provides practical, non-partisan advice and consensus-driven strategies informed by available evidence to increase public safety and strengthen communities. In the US, justice reinvestment has been pushed along with a redefinition of public safety. The focus became, became what can be done to strengthen the capacity of high incarceration neighbourhoods to keep their res residents out of prison, in, not where should we send this individual. The solution to public safety was locally tailored and locally determined. In 2013, a paper co-authored by a group of researchers, analysts and advocates um, oh, there was a typo there, called Ending Mass, Mass Incarceration summarised the success so far. Where 27 US states have participated in one way or another in the reform. And of the 27 states, approximately 18 of these have enacted legislation for the purposes of implementing a justice reinvestment strategy. So, you know, it's a big deal. 27 US states have adopted this. Adopting justice reinvestment legislation um, has occurred in, in a number of states. So Connecticut in 2004, Kansas in 2007, Texas in 2007, Rhode Island in 2008, and Arizona in 2008 allowed these states at a local level to reduce violations of parole, parole and probation, hold parole hearings at the point of parole eligibility, or re-establish earned good time credits. Additionally, in Oregon, using justice reinvestment, they were able to reduce the juvenile incarceration rate by a staggering 72%. And we always talk about Dallas, the Wild West of America, um, and we hope that the same thing can happen to the Wild West of Australia, um, where for the first time ever their incarceration rates stopped growing and recently they've closed three prisons. Yeah. The US example as a success not only reduced the financial burden, reducing the cost to the taxpayers, which was the ultimate aim when they first came up with this, it was all about money, but also socially and culturally it decreased crime and improved community safety. So it was a win-win. So to, to demonstrate the success that justice reinvestment has had in the US, I'd like to show you an interview from Lateline earlier this year or it might have been last year, with Jerry Madden. Sorry, it was last year. Um, he was the former chairman of the Texas House of Representative Corrections Committee and senior fellow uh, with the right on crime about how investment in crime prevention has worked in Dallas. So where do we turn to to find world's best practice? 
Dallas, Texas. Jerry Madden is the former chairman of the Texas House of Representatives Corrections Committee and now a senior fellow with the think tank Right on Crime. When he was appointed to the Corrections Committee in 2007, Texas was planning to spend half a billion dollars on new prisons to cope with surging crime rates. But Jerry Madden had a better idea. He and his Republican colleagues reinvested much of that money into crime prevention programs. Before their initiative, the prison population in Texas was projected to increase by 5,000 inmates in just one year. Instead, it grew by just 500. Jerry Madden now joins us from Dallas, Texas. Jerry Madden, welcome to Late Line. Emma, I'm glad to be here and thank you very much for having me. Now, help us understand what you were facing. What were incarceration numbers like in Texas when you joined the Corrections Committee? What was the extent of the challenge you were facing? The challenge actually I was given was uh, given me by the Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives in 2005 when he called me in and said, you're Chairman of Corrections. And I asked him, well, Mr. Chairman, what do you want me to do? And he gave me the eight words that changed my life. He said, don't build new prisons. They cost too much. We have over 150,000 people in the prisons of Texas. We have another had another 78,000 that were on parole and over 400,000 that were on probation. So we have a very large system. In 2007, when we started the, the major work that we did in justice reinvestment, we had a projection that said we were going to add 17,700 prisoners by the year 2012. And since that wasn't my uh, objective that I had been given by my speaker, we started looking at ways that how could you change it so we didn't get an additional 17,000 people. We quickly looked at the, the, could we open the doors and let people go or could we slow them down coming in and figured out the best way in Texas was certainly to try to figure out a way to slow them down coming in. So we where did you programs. start? Yes. I started in probation. Uh, they had some very uh, progressive thinking people who had some good ideas that said, gee, if you could have some more money available for us, we could reduce the number of people coming to prison. So we started looking there in our 2005 legislation, uh, looked at that, we came within one vote of getting it passed. Uh, but, but in 2007, we had taken the ideas that was in that legislation and expanded on it so we didn't look just at the area of people who were coming in and had not been to prison, but we looked at those who had left that were on parole. We looked at those and how to treat them when they're in prison. And we looked at even earlier when we looked at our juvenile system, when we looked at the education system, and when we looked even earlier back into the early family situations and how could you break that cycle of, of people coming to prison, this pathway to prison, as it's called. And where do you, where do, you do the break points? And fortunately for us, what happened in 2007 is with this projection of additional people, they projected we needed to build three prisons immediately in that legislative session at a cost of 500 plus million dollars. We knew at that time what programs we needed to break that cycle, where we needed to put them, and we, needed, we knew by then how much money it was going to cost for us to do that, and it was significantly less than the $500 million that, that they were asking for for new prisons. We were able to talk our colleagues in the legislature into giving us a chance with our program. And since that time, we've been highly successful. So how many of those three extra prisons were built? None. <laughs> we, we, actually, we actually put some money into additional substance abuse treatment beds. But we built no prisons. And in fact, in 2011, the state of Texas closed a prison and in the cycle they're going through now in 2013 in the legislature, it appears that they're going to close at least two more prisons. Uh, it's, we still have a lot of prisons, but that's the first time that they had ever closed a prison in the state of Texas. In so, two, between our 2011 legislative session and this one, we're down over 6,000 prisoners in, in, the, in the state prisons. And our crime rate is down, and, uh, and we're having extreme success in, in people not returning to prison. So tell us then, all the research you did in that early phase, where did they direct, where did that uh, essentially direct your spend? What did that tell you about where the money was best allocated? We, we've actually seen a results. The, the results we're seeing was, is a great place to look. We looked at substance abuse treatment. We gave them more capabilities to do substance abuse because there's a large number of people there. We looked at mental health 
and provided additional funding into the mental health areas because there are a lot of people in our prisons that have some type of mental diagnosis. And we found that the greatest success that, that we had was in our parole, those people who had been to prison and providing them with things like mentors, things like uh, capabilities going back into the community, things like intermediate sanctions for our parole people. Our parole rates have dropped, our parole revocations have dropped substantially from over 10,000 that we had in, in 2005 to just around 6,000 revocations that we had this last year. So that's a huge cut in the number of people actually returning back to prison. So what can you tell us about the cost of building new prisons compared to the cost of crime prevention programs like you've detailed? Well, they're substantially, they're substantially less expensive. A, a new prison in, in Texas, depending on what type you build, whether it's high security, medium or, or low security prisons, will run somewhere around $200 million to build and, and another in a biennium about $40 million to operate. Uh, so what we successfully did is stopping building prisons for 17,700 people was probably about seven or eight or nine prisons that we didn't build. We figured we had saved the state at least $2 billion in, in that period of time. In fact, probably more. Uh, the programs in the community cost a whole lot less. Uh, probation programs, uh, maybe three or four dollars a person a day. Well, it costs us 50 bucks a day to uh, uh, imprison them in the, in the state prisons. So I guess you've probably answered my next question, which was that traditionally the conservative side of politics is all about being tough on crime, throwing away the key. So I was struggling to understand how these policies squared with your Republican roots. Uh, it actually squared quite well because we are also an economic party that believes in, in, in the best utilization of our taxpayers' funds. And if you make your community safer and you reduce crime and you also change lives and you change them for the better, you've in fact accomplished major goals. Uh, you can also do better things for victims of crime. I mean, it's, it's better to have a victim get uh, compensation. And they certainly don't get a lot of compensation for somebody who's locked up in the prisons, whereas if they're a worker and, and paying taxes and can, can repay the crimes, most, most victims of crime, not, not all, but most, uh, would like to be recompensed for their uh, losses that they had, and that's a preferable way to even help the victims of crime. Tell us how your approach has spread throughout the United States. We uh, worked with several different groups nationally. I was... Uh, on the board of every major legislative group that we have in this country, the National Conference of State Legislators, American Legislative Exchange Conference, Council of State Governments and our Justice Center. And in doing that, we've gone out and told them what Texas did. And, and in telling them that, we've been able to communicate to many legislators uh, what we did, how we did it, and, and why it's a good policy to do, whether you're conservative or you're liberal or moderate, doesn't matter. There are gains there for everyone to make. We're better off spending money uh, wisely than we are spending, spending it foolishly, and that's what's been the major message to other states that have been picked up through all of these organizations so that states like Georgia and Kentucky and Ohio and Oklahoma and others have gone and followed the same path that we had with a pretty fair amount of success in their states also. Now we have a Senate inquiry starting here in Australia tomorrow on this very issue. What do you think are the lessons Australia can learn from your experience? Well, well there were several that I tell legislators to do. First of all, I tell them the easiest part is to pass legislation. Uh, the, the, the next easiest part is to implement programs So make sure they're implemented well and that they operate in the way that you, you know, wanted them to and that they get the results that you expect them to get. Don't, you know, don't just go do a program because it sounds good. Do it because it's evidence-based and it's, it's resource-oriented such that you are pretty confident that you will get those results. And, and the third thing is monitor the program. And the fourth thing is be able to react and have data that shows that you're being successful. So require in anything you do, whatever it is, that the lesson I would say is make sure that you require whoever is doing your programs and whatever programs you have, that they provide you as a responsibility in their program to give you data that shows that it's working and that they're getting approximately the results that you anticipated.
Jerry Madden, we have to leave it there. Congratulations on your achievements and we thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us this evening. Emma, I'm quite honoured to be there and it's this morning here where I'm at. <laughs>
the dollars start racking up. But there, there's a lot more to step two, the quantifying the savings. <laughs> step three, um, sorry, is the developing uh, Generate savings. I, I'm going to say this bit. I had it's not in my speech. I took it out because I didn't want to be too political. But I think sometimes, rather than having to get the savings first, you could just have um, the political will to just put that investment in, and say, look, we don't actually have to change all of this. We can just put the the, the the emphasis on prevention and diversion now. And I think to some extent that's happening. But I mean, if we can generate savings as well. That's so important, you know. So um, I see you shaking your head, Paul. I'd love to hear your perspective. I want to actually acknowledge Paul Papali, and I was going to acknowledge him later, but Paul's the first person who really started to bring this um, into play in politics here in WA, um, and, and it's really great to have you here. Um, so perhaps we can uh, have a bit of time for Q&A at the end. Um, so the, the next step is to quantify the savings and reinvest in the high needs community. Um, so this is according to the needs identified in the mapping. For example, if the mapping shows that the high risk community has a high incidence of crime related to drug and alcohol abuse, then of course you're going to put a drug and alcohol uh, abuse program into that high risk community. Um, this stage can involve the participation of non-governmental community organisations and possibly even local government. Um, and also once the resources are invested into those high risk communities, judges and the judiciary can be more confident about sentencing offenders to the community based <coughs> options, uh, thereby reducing incarceration and providing genuine alternatives to imprisonment. So the third, so one, map, two, get the savings, three, put the save, reinvest the savings in a targeted way into the high risk communities. And then of course the fourth one is to measure and evaluate. Um, the methodology will operate differently in each location due to administrative and community differences and should be amended according to its results. Through this system of evaluation, programs that are effective can be nurtured and adapted for other communities and programs that are not effective can be retired. Eventually there will be an expansive database of programs and organisations which have proven results in diverting people from crime and from incarceration. This step, like step one, depends on appropriate monitoring systems to collate data uh, across agencies on outcomes and the capacity of agencies to collect, record and monitor the data required. The whole series are a cycle so that the mapping is done on a regular basis and high risk communities are continually identified and invested in. It is an incredibly convincing social net to provide common sense policy initiatives for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in our community. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. That's a very simplistic view of it. As you can hear from, from um, the guy from, from Texas, that there's a lot more involved in it and there's a lot of information on websites, particularly from America, about how they've done it in each state and, and, and that real local level. Uh, but now I want to talk about some of the challenges uh, in implementing a justice reinvestment framework in Australia. So the first challenge is our federal system of government <laughs> and law and order being the under the jurisdiction of the states. Um, if justice reinvestment is to be adopted nationally, it will require agree agreement and cooperation of all states and territories and the federal government. And as we know, getting these layers of government to agree on anything is difficult, but it's not impossible. It will require strong leadership at all levels and a commitment to addressing the underlying causal factors of offending, including with regards to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There has been a national commitment of this magnitude in this area of justice before, regarding which was the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody, but that was over 20 years ago and many of those recommendations have not been implemented. One thing that I think is favourable to justice reinvestment over the recommendations of the Royal Commission is that it's a lot more simple. There were 339 recommendations of the Royal Commission and I find that when we start to talk about it, policy makers' eyes kind of glaze over and it's, it's too hard for them to deal with. Justice reinvestment is a little bit more simple and it's not just for Aboriginal people, it's a system reform for the whole community, but one that we know that will benefit Aboriginal people and, and, and maybe not solve straight away, but work towards solving this, this crisis that, that, it, that is underway here in WA and Australia. Um, 
If it cannot be agreed that all of Australia will adopt justice reinvestment, and despite our lobbying and our campaigning that we've done, we haven't got that agreement yet, um, there's certainly scope for it to be implemented on a state-by-state -state basis, such as what occurred in the US. In fact, the US model is, is based on that, um, so it might even work better. And with the high rates of detention and, and recidivism of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Western Australia, there is every reason why Western Australia could exercise leadership in this area and be the first state in Australia to trial such an approach. The next challenge is data collection, which, as I said, is the cornerstone of justice reinvestment and any form of sort of smart on crime approach to justice. Unfortunately, in Australia, we don't have standardised data collection. And the methods and collection of data recorded by each state and territory is different. Um, in fact, the only national survey of data collection until recently, WA didn't even join in, um, but WA has, start, has come on board with that now. But even that, it, it's ha ad hoc and all over the place, and um, that's why I sort of think it might be easier just to do it on a state-by-state -state level. But when I was at Congress, um, we were working with some people in the data area, and we were advocating for standardised data collection um, and nationally consistent approaches to a number of things, including the identification of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on self-identification. In some jurisdictions, you know, the police just tick if they think it is someone, um, whereas the person needs to be able to self-identify. Uh, the length of time taken to uh, finalise matters in court, rates of assault for crime victims who report to police. I actually haven't got into victimisation much, but justice reinvestment, it, because it's focused on this prevention and diversion, it, it, it actually has the ability to prevent people becoming victims just as much as preventing people from becoming offenders, um, especially when there's domestic violence issues. Um, you, you know, you find that, that a woman who's in a domestic violence situation, unless, unless she's given the, the strength and the power to get out of it, she'll just go into another one. So there's all these sort of um, diversionary programs that will, will, will prevent offending and victimisation. So we want proper recording of that sort of information um, and family violence, uh, proper recording of the effectiveness of programs for perpetrators of family violence, uh, measuring the effectiveness of diversionary programs, including warnings, cautions, conferences and treatment programs, and the health and housing status of people released from prison and youth detention. But once again, if we want to do this on a national level, it's going to re require a cooperation of all the states and territories, and, and you know, people are going to, states and territories are going to have to do things differently, and it's, it's a big ask to get us that organised to do our data collection nas in a nationally consistent way. There have been a number of ideas floated as to how this would occur, um, including that all the data be collected by one agency, such as the Australian Bureau of Statistics or the Productivity Commission. Um, however, even if that's the case, the political will part is quite, quite hard to overcome. And for, for this reason, once again, I think it might be easier to implement justice reinvestment on a state or territory jurisdictional basis for now rather than federally. I mean, it would be great if Australia could just come and say, we're going to do this and we're all going to do it together. Yeah, so the next one is the tough on crime rhetoric. Another challenge, this is political will. So tough on crime promises are always floated, particularly by state and territory governments. Um, and it's going to take some time to be able to counter the historical propaganda that has been fed to people about prisons making our communities safer. However, things are starting to change. And you know, just with that regard, we've got to keep reminding ourselves that Australia was established as a penal colony. We have this history of punishment in Australia and locking people up. And that's where we come from and, and we've all been raised with it. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Should I just take that talking? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, we've all been raised and we don't even realise we're thinking in this punishment focus a lot of the time. But so a lot of the campaign work that I've been involved in has really, before we can get the policy makers to agree to big changes, we need to get a change, in a shift in thinking, a change in the rhetoric. So there's a lot of campaigns that have been advocating for this change in thinking. There's um, the New South Wales campaign, Just Reinvest Now, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. 
There's the Victorian initiative called Smart Justice. Uh, the West Australian Aboriginal Deaths in Custody ran a campaign called Build Communities, Not Prisons. Uh, Queensland ran a campaign called Project 10%. Um, and there's many more, and bit by bit, uh, I think we're all influencing the popular voting, and 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 we are getting there. But it's really strong leadership is needed in the area of justice, particularly on state and territory levels. And and I believe the change will come. And I think I think we're hearing it all the time: people talking about prevention and diversion and rehabilitation, rather than this punishment focus all the time. Um, Western Australia has recently shown very promising signs earlier this year when it established its Youth uh, Justice Advisory Board specifically to reduce um, youth detention. But then at the same time, we've got this bill in Parliament <laughs> saying that it's going to remove the Young Offenders Act and, and uh, make mandatory sentencing for kids involved in home burglary. So, you know, you've got You've got the government department trying its best to move to prevention and diversion, and then you've got Parliament still going down the tough on crime. So we really need to get all the policy and decision makers in WA working together and on the same level. The next uh, barrier is geography and remoteness, and this is quite specific to Australia. And, and you know we have to be quite considered about this. In the US, justice reinvestment has been most effective in high-density ghetto-like suburbs. Uh, where the highest concentration of offending was found. When I said we did a little bit of mapping here in WA and we had like remote communities like the Nuttendara Lands and Derby coming up really high, it costs a lot more to put prevention and diversionary programs in a remote community than it does in a ghetto-like suburb of Texas. Um, so the feasibility goes down. You're not going to save as much money straight away. You probably will in the long run, but there, there are issues with that and we need to be realistic about it. I don't think that this alone is good enough reason to not at least trial justice reinvestment, perhaps in a community of, of Western Australia or Australia. But um, yeah, perhaps the financial benefits and, and the American system was pretty messed up. Um, <laughs> it was pretty broken and there was lots that they could do to fix it pretty quickly, whereas ours isn't quite as broken as theirs. Um, the next thing that is a challenge is this identification of the high-risk communities. Uh, in order to get the political, this is if we go on this national level, in order to get the political buy-in of all the states and territories, they're all going to want to benefit from justice reinvestment and have you know, a high-risk community trial in their state or territory. But justice reinvestment isn't supposed to be about polit politicking, it's about stats. We do the mapping, we see where the high-risk ones communities are and we put the efforts in there. Um, I, I think if we did mapping nationally and with nationally consistent data collection, it would come up pretty clear that there's a few states that are really high risk. And probably WA is one of them, and I think Northern Territory would have a lot. But I don't know that Victoria would, or I don't know that New South Wales would. I mean, it's all just... So there, there's that political hot pot with it. Um, and there's a challenge for decision makers uh, to prevent this. But again, I think narrowing to a state or territory level can avoid this. I think that it could re reduce those tensions. Uh, you might get the Perth versus the regions argument, but that might work anyway. Um, so there are a number of challenges and, and you know, they're good things that we really need to consider and probably has a lot to do why um, it hasn't been adopted really quickly in Australia. And we need to think carefully about these challenges as proceeding with justice reinvestment will be one of the most radical overhauls to the justice system of Australia ever. Despite these challenges, uh, the benefits to our nation, both socially and economically, are too great to ignore. No one wants their child, their partner or even their friends to end up in jail and a system that can prevent and divert people from such a life is one worth fighting for. Despite these challenges, uh, there's been a lot of work done to promote justice reinvestment and its underlying philosophies here in Australia. So since it was first introduced by Tom Kalmer back in, in 2009, it's been spoken about at many conferences and forums. There have been many articles written about it. There's campaigns launched to encourage its adoption and it's been referred to in a number of government inquiries. The combined advocacy resulted in a Senate inquiry into the value of a justice reinvestment approach to the criminal justice in Australia, which released its report in June, uh, 20th of June last year. 
the inquiry received over 120 submissions, and some of those submissions were excellent. If you get a chance, I actually think the Wacos su submission was one of the best that went in. Um, and nearly all of those 120 submissions were supportive in their nature. And there was a ground, as it was obvious that there was this groundswell of support. So justice reinvestment, the, the campaign for it in Australia, it has come from the grassroots up. The key recommendations of that report were that the government take the Commonwealth government take a lead role in data collection and sharing, that the long-term sustainable funding be committed to justice reinvestment. They wanted the establishment of a justice reinvestment clearinghouse. They wanted the Commonwealth to take a leadership role through COAG. They wanted the Commonwealth to fund some trials for justice reinvestment, including one in a remote Aboriginal community. Uh, the standing they wanted the Standing Committee on Law and Justice, uh, which is for the Year 11 and 12 students. That's all the Attorney Generals, state and federal, come together, a bit like COAG, but for the Attorney Generals. Um, to promote the establishment of an independent central coordinating body um, and that justice targets be included as part of the close, close the gap framework. Um, the, the independent central coordinating body is quite interesting and the Greens did a lot of work on that as well, that, that, that's readily available. The current Australian government must respond to the inquiry. So this, this came out in June, then we had the election, we got the new government and it's not high on their priorities at the moment but they do have to respond. So we will keep pushing them for that response um, at the federal level. But outside of the federal government, there's been a groundswell of activity continuing to push for the adoption of justice reinvestment in Australia. A standout is the Just Reinvest campaign for Aboriginal young people in uh, New South Wales. Uh, their website states, Just Reinvest New South Wales aims to reduce the shameful overrepresentation of Aboriginal young people in custody. The purpose of Just Reinvest New South Wales is to convince the New South Wales Government to adopt a justice reinvestment approach to Aboriginal young people and their communities. We believe the time is right for the New South Wales Government to significantly shift policy and spending away from incarceration towards prevention, early intervention and treatment for Aboriginal young people at risk. This campaign is really well structured. Um, there's a number of community champions, there's organisational members, uh, some of the, the key organisations that are involved include the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Aboriginal Legal Services, um, the community of Burke itself where, where they're um, pushing for a pilot um, and that's been approved. It's well underway with significant community support and Just Reinvest is working very closely with the community members of Burke to, to implement this trial. Um, if you'd like more information, go to their website. Um, I just wanted to show you just briefly just something from there. It's, it's a different approach. I mean, this is a lobbying exercise to try and get the New South Wales government to take it on, to take on justice reinvestment. Um, oh, hang on, just in all the lobbying and stuff that I've been involved with justice reinvestment, we always have this debate: do we make it just an Aboriginal thing, or do we make it for everyone? My preference is for everyone because justice reinvestment is for everyone. Um, but they've taken the approach with this campaign to, to, to push it just down the Aboriginal angle. So this is just a little bit of a taste of some of their stuff. G'day guys. My name's Jack Manning Bancroft and I'm the CEO of an organisation called AIM that supports Indigenous high school kids to strive for a future filled with hope, aspiration and ultimately success. Now many of us know that this is not the normal future facing an Aboriginal child born in Australia today. For Aboriginal people, we are often overrepresented in custody and tick every box of disadvantage. But with great challenges come great opportunities. We now have a very special chance to reimagine a future for our Indigenous young people. A future filled with positivity and not despair. A future focused on prevention and not cure. And hopefully a future that has a funding model that supports early intervention to get in there and provide a platform for Indigenous young people to be able to choose a future filled with success, hope and aspiration like we want for any Australian child. Now I'm very, very lucky that I now have the opportunity to introduce three young people who are living that story, who are out there trying to change those statistics. 
and you're now going to get the chance to hear from three very successful and inspiring young Indigenous people. Hi, I'm Jo. Hi, I'm Ray. Hi, I'm Jay. And, and this is our story. Challenges for me growing up was, um, you know, I used to move around a lot from place to place, never actually adapt to one place. And my brother making new friends is really hard for us, you know. And, um, when I was very young, I was with Docs and they moved me away from my family, so that was very hard on me, very challenging. You know, we used to stay with my brother or sister much, and you know, the transition to high school was very tough on me. I used to get picked a lot, picked on a lot, and you know, just breaking down. It's very challenging, one big roller coaster. Some of the challenges I faced growing up was not having a mum around, and being a girl, I think every girl needs their mum. Um, also, probably through school and high school, um, first of all, people they had bad perceptions of Aboriginal people, like they will never go anywhere in life, or a lot of them just have babies for the benefits and stuff like that. Um, also, I probably made some choices that weren't so good that affected my family and my friends. The challenge I faced was like hanging around the wrong crowd, like not going to school, plus I was moving a lot, that's with dogs and being separated from my family. My trick of a change was, um, you know, finally moving in with my grandparents and finding that sustainability and, you know, really good change and, like, helping me out, staying in the one spot with all my mates and stuff. And, you know, once I moved out there, I kind of hooked up with um, the Cool Kids Club and the LARPA Bombers, both youth havens, and, um, you know, they helped me change a lot and, you know, grow more maturity and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I've been doing that for a couple of years. And once I switched from primary school to high school, um, kind of graduated from Cool Kids to a switch leader. With, um, yeah, so that was pretty good. And uh, John O'Carey helped me out, and it gave me the opportunity to represent my community in um, the Blank Page Summit over in the Kimberleys, and it was a really big change for me and made me realise who I am and stuff and you know, it's pretty good. I got to represent my community, I was very proud of myself. My trigger for change is probably when I would come home after three days of being out and see my dad and he would look really stressed and sick and worried. So I guess I thought about my dad. Um, also probably losing a lot of my friends to going to custody or getting in trouble with police. Um, also I never had enough money to do the things I wanted to do. Um, and then I went on a program called White Line and they helped me mature a lot and get a job. Trigger for change was like going to Palm and meeting up with the Weave, with Weave, and that was getting me into like building outdoor wrecks like caving. And then I wanted to get like skills for work and play footy. My hopes for the future is that I can become a great role model and leader in my own life and in my community. You know, it would be a really big achievement. And um, you know, finishing high school that'd be really fun. Like, be good, great, and um, you know, getting a good job, earn great money, get a good education with that, and you know, just having a family, being a good role model for my son, and you know my community as well. Hopefully in the future I can have a career within the government sector and I want to have a high up position so I can be an Indigenous representative. Also I hope, uh, I hope that sharing my story will encourage the media to produce other positive stories about Aboriginal youth and also um, I want to prove not only to myself but to others that you can, like if you work hard you can go anywhere and own your own home and have a good future. My hopes for the future is getting into NRL and working in construction and have a family. We're determined to prove society wrong. We're not going to be another statistic. We're going to be good role models for our people. The Justice Reinvestment Campaign for Aboriginal young people aims to reduce the overrepresentation of young Aboriginal people held in custody in New South Wales. It aims to shift the spending that is currently allocated towards prisons, towards community-based programs, the ones of the like that supported Jess, Trey or Raymond. Programs that build confidence and self-esteem, that provide education and employment. 
programs that change lives. Programs that would cost the government on average $10,000 per participant, as opposed to the current cost of $240,000 that it costs per detainee in custody. Justice reinvestment in New South Wales is a good investment. It's an investment that makes sense and it's an investment that will help us build our young Indigenous people to become Australia's future leaders. I mean, it's an interesting campaign in that they've gone very narrow, Aboriginal young people in New South Wales, um, but they are actually having a lot of success and a lot of that is due to the partnerships they're happening, particularly like people like Mick Gooder have really got behind this, the Human Rights Commission, um, the, the Aboriginal Legal Services, so uh, they're doing quite well in New South Wales, but we don't have anything nearly that coordinated in WA. Uh, another project that is gaining momentum is the Australian Justice Reinvestment project, the AJR project, which is um, a national research project investigating the characteristics of justice reinvestment. It draws together senior researchers across the disciplines of law and criminology to examine justice reinvestment programs in other countries and analyse whether such programs can be developed in Australia. One of their researchers is Melanie Schwartz, who's assisted me with this, um, and she's recently been to the United States seeking to learn from their 10 years of experience. She asked justice reinvestment experts in the US what they thought the preconditions for a successful justice reinvestment strategy in Australia might be based on the American experience. They offered a range of fascinating suggestions and some of them are up here uh, to have very clear aims including what counts as success, is success about particular outcomes and which ones, the integrity of the process, uh, the balance, the involvement of government experts and community and that's a really important um, aspect, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, for example, this is suggested to get the locals involved in some of the data collection. Um, that way they can give guidance about what data would be most useful. Uh, they said to make sure that there's a broad representation of stakeholders around the table, uh, not just corrections and peoples and not just po policy makers. Uh, the time frame for justice program, justice for investment programs, the diversionary programs, um, should be long enough to ensure true community buy-in, uh, allow proper assessment of the impact of policy changes and have technical and other support embedded in a location long enough to guide follow-through, not just set up. Um, and this is a particular issue we have here in Australia. Most of the successful diversionary programs are run on a pilot and not given any more money, even when they're successful. Even the proceeds of crime money, um, they are only one-off funding. So you have something that's incredibly successful, it's working in a community, everyone loves it, and it gets canned. We've seen this happen time and time again. And then the last um, thing that they suggest is to build an independent evaluation of justice reinvestment programs to collect lessons and learn uh, for guide for future directions. So that's kind of a bit of an approach of what's happening in Australia, but there's stuff happening all over the place. Like I said, it's this grassroots movement moving up, and the Senate inquiry was a really important aspect. I remember when we got the Senate inquiry, um, we had like people running down the halls. We were so excited because we didn't think we were going to get that, and we really were gaining traction. And then we've had the change of government, so you know now sort of looking back on the states and territories that to take the leadership in this area. So with that in mind, I just wanted to end looking a little bit at Western Australia. Um, so, like I said, we don't have this uh, coordinated campaign like they've got in New South Wales. Um, but of course we've got Paul Papalia, who I'm really happy is here at the moment. Um, and in 2010, when he was the Shadow Minister for Corrective Services, he advocated for the reform and, and wrote a really great paper on that. So that started to get it uh, discussed here in Western Australia. And around that time, um, a coalition of organisations formed a Justice Reinvestment WA Committee. I was part of that committee, uh, but the committee lost traction and we've since disbanded. We had like, um, uh, there was Outcare, we had the Aboriginal Legal Services, we had Wanada, um, the drug service, we had, Joseph, did you guys come? 
Yeah, so that's Joseph Wallum from the Office of the Inspector Custodial Services at the back. Um, you guys were involved. So we had some really great players, but we were all sort of in this not-for-profit, non-government sector, and we just didn't get that buy-in that we needed. Uh, but we do have a lot of high-level support here in Western Australia within the judiciary, including WA's first female judge, Antoinette Kennedy, and Chief Justice Wayne Martin. Uh, we've also had some promising comments from the Minister of Corrective Services, Joe Francis. Um, in May last year, he said, call it justice reinvestment or prevention programs or whatever it might be, the principles of spending money to get people on the right track to stop them breaking the law and ending in jail makes sense. He went further and said that of the 700 million spent on corrective services each year, surely more than 2 million could go to prevention. Of interest is also a blog written by the Police Commissioner Carlo Callahan in support of justice reinvestment. He wrote that unless we adopt a vaccination approach to crime prevention, we are always going to be treating the symptoms rather than the causes. Current thinking around justice reinvestment is part of this approach. It would be great to see a coordinated campaign here in Western Australia like the one happening in New South Wales. Um, and I encourage any of you who are interested to consider their approach and how it might be adapted here in WA. In particular, I'd like to see a trial in a remote community of WA. Um, and I've done a little bit of work with the Mowenjum community and they're quite interested, but we, again, we need that political buy-in. Um, but that's one of the recommendations of the Senate inquiry. So we've got the trial underway in Burke um, in New South, regional New South Wales, but uh, a regional town of New South Wales is very different to a remote community of Western Australia. Uh, we, if we are going to adopt anything in Western Australia, I think we really need to work closely with America and a particular states to see how that they've done it and observe the suggestions from the US experience and probably work with the re senior researchers like Melanie Schwartz and people like that at the, um, what's it called? The Australian Justice Reinvestment Project. Um, but I think of critical importance for Western Australia is that balancing of stakeholders. And, and when we had our initial committee, that's what we didn't get right. We, 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 need, we need government sitting at the table alongside the Aboriginal organisations and, and the community organisations, maybe even local government. We all need to come together to work on this. Um, so in summary, another 10 minutes left. <laughs> I've today outlined the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the justice system and touched on the underlying causes of the overrepresentation. I noted that the tra trajectories for incarceration is expected to rise significantly over the next 20 years due to that huge youth population coming up. I explained about the concept of justice reinvestment as a framework for reform of the justice system. Um, aimed at diverting people from high-risk communities, especially repeat offenders. And I noted some of the challenges to implementing this in Australia, including lessons learned from the American experience. And I've noted on a number of times today that many of the challenges that, I, that we can see can actually be overcome by implementing it on a state and territory basis rather than on a federal level. So with that in mind, I want to end the lecture with a call to action. Uh, to the Western Australian Government, if there's any representatives here, um, and organisations and parliamentarians to take the lead in implementing justice reinvestment here in WA, uh, especially starting with a trial in a remote community. So thank you again for your time and for me to be able to deliver this prestigious lecture.